My boss here at Chat Sports will only give me the green light to do a watch party for Monday Night Football if we can reach 17,400 subscribers. That's the number for me to get a producer and do a Broncos Bills watch party. And we are only 54 subs away. So if you're looking for a Broncos YouTube channel, help me out. And in return, we can do a watch party. What's going on, Broncos country? Coming up on today's show, we're going to discuss the possibility of Denver signing Jason Pierre-Paul and whether or not it would make sense for the Broncos. And then we're going to look at an ESPN trade article. I know the deadline has passed, but they already looked ahead to 2024, so I thought we could see who they think might be on the move. But let's start things off with JPP. As Josina Anderson tweeted out, just got off the phone with free agent defensive end slash outside linebacker Jason Pierre-Paul, who emphatically said he can help any NFL pass rush now. Here's what JPP told Josina. I've been training my ass off, even though I'm not on a team. I've been looking at a lot of football lately, and I feel like I can still make a contender shift now. There are plenty of teams that still need a pass rush, so I'm just waiting for that call. If you go back and watch the film with the Ravens, you can see I played very physical. Even in that first game, I did tremendously good. Film don't lie. Whatever team I end up on is going to get the best of me. I'll be all out. I don't need a whole season. There are teams I want to be on. Now, I still think Jason Pierre-Paul can play at a high level. Now, I know he's looking to join a contender, but it's November. You don't have a whole lot of options. So if the only team that gives you a call that goes and says, We'll give you $2 million for the next two months of your service. I'm guessing JPP is grabbing his coat, and he's on the next flight to Denver. So I think the Broncos could still land Jason Pierre-Paul, even if he is looking for a contender. And hey, if Denver wins on Monday night, sitting at 4-5, and five, maybe he thinks he could be one of the final pieces of the puzzle to help them go on a true playoff run. But let's kind of get to know JPP a little bit better. He started 13 games for Baltimore last season in year 13. Now, he's got two Super Bowl rings. I don't know which fingers they're on, but he has won two. And in his career, he has been prolific. Like, he is, I think he's going to be an NFL Hall of Famer, right? Wouldn't you agree? 94 and a half career sacks? Maybe. He's borderline. Uh, Three-time Pro Bowler, one-time All-Pro. But JPP, we know, when he was at the top of his game, was one of the best edge rushers in football. Now, he has not been at the top of the mountain for a few years now. Last two seasons, three sacks, two and a half sacks. But you're not signing JPP to play a full season as a starter, right? If you're adding him in November, you are looking to bring in some extra depth and deepen your rotation a little bit, not to play 17 games. And so if the Broncos are looking for a little bit of a boost at the halfway mark, JPP can bring that. Because we look at Denver's defensive line, and maybe he plays outside linebacker, but with Browning, Bonito, and Cooper, I feel like they feel they're set at outside linebacker. But at defensive line, it's Zach Allen. That's it from this three-man band. It's just Zach Allen doing anything. DJ Jones is average against the run, but you didn't sign him to rush the passer. Jonathan Harris is borderline unstartable. There's just no one really all that much better. Maybe Mike Purcell. But Zach Allen is the only one of these three players generating any sort of pass rush. And so if you want to toss JPP into that mix and help out Jonathan Cooper, Nick Bonito, Baron Browning, give them an extra breather or two, let JPP play on first and 10 so that Cooper, Bonito, and Allen are a little bit more fresh for third and seven when you know they're passing it. I'll also add this to the pros list for signing JPP. One injury away. Really, like if something were to happen to Cooper or Benito or Browning, look at the front five. Perkins and Coom, like you have guys that no one has heard of as the next man up on this team. And Cooper and Browning and Benito at one point were all in their shoes where they were behind Bradley Chubb, Von Miller, Frank Clark even for a moment, Randy Gregory, and they filled in quite nicely. But I don't think you're going to have that much depth beyond those three players. And so you are one snap away from having, I would say, a crisis at edge rusher. You add Jason Pierre-Paul, you buy yourself a pretty nice insurance policy 
midway through the season. So if you were George Payton, Sean Payton, whoever's really calling the shots at mile high, would you sign Jason Pierre-Paul? I would. I think this would make a ton of sense for the Broncos, but I want to know what your thoughts are down in the comment section. Next up on the show, we're going to talk about a potential trade candidate in 2024. Once again, October 31st was the NFL trade deadline. There could be no trades until the new league year starts in March of 2024. But ESPN decided, you know what? F it. We're going to look ahead and start predicting some trades that might go down in March. So before we get to that, a quick word from our friends over at Prize Picks. Now, you're probably wondering, Petey, what is Prize Picks? Well, let me tell you. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you can pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. With quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types, Prize Picks is the number one daily fantasy sports app. So for week 10, these are the selections I am rolling with. I like the more on Mac Jones' passing yards. It might be win or go home for Bill Belichick. You better believe Mac is going to be at the top of his game. I like the less for Kenny Pickett's passing yards, though. He's not a very good quarterback. I don't see them spraying the ball all over the field. I like the less. But I like the more as we make a more, less, more sandwich for Deshaun Watson's passing yards. It's the lowest of all three quarterbacks, and he has looked the best of all three quarterbacks, I would say, this year when he's on his A game. So for that reason, I like the more. Go to prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. The link for that is in the comments and description of today's video. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Drum roll, please. Justin Simmons, come on down. ESPN listed you as a trade candidate in 2024, and we are right back to where we were for the last couple of months. But there is some facts to be shared about this, and that is the Broncos are currently $3.8 million over the salary cap, so they are going to have to trim some fat and get below zero before that new league year starts. Now, 2024 is the last year of Justin Simmons' contract, and he's got an $18.2 million cap hit, and they can save quite a bit of money either moving on from him, like releasing him, or trading him and getting that contract off their books. So with Simmons turning 30 years old, Denver being in the red next year, and him having a huge cap hit, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to connect the dots that Simmons will likely be a trade candidate once that new league year gets started. Now, here's what Dan Graziano from ESPN had to say about all this. But while the Broncos didn't upload unload any of their big contracts at the trade deadline, there's certainly a chance they look to do it in the offseason. Simmons turns 30 this month and is scheduled to earn $14.5 million non-guaranteed next season in the final year of his contract. Denver would incur a minimal $3.75 million in dead money and save a save $14.5 million if they cut or traded him. Justin Simmons, as a trade candidate, always, talk, always hurts to talk about because he is one of my favorite players on this team. But if we're looking in the future here, like I said earlier, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the writing may be on the wall that doesn't really matter how well Justin Simmons plays the rest of the season. Unless he goes at an all-pro level the rest of the way, I think this very well could be his last year in Denver, right? If Justin Simmons plays pretty well, well, that's just going to increase his trade value. If Justin Simmons does not play well, that's going to make moving on from him a lot more digestible. Now, Simmons over the last four years continues to be one of the most underappreciated offenders in our game. The guy had six interceptions last year. He missed four games. He missed five games. And he was tied for the league lead in interceptions. He's an absolute ball hawk of a safety. He's great against the run. He can do whatever you ask him to do. He's a phenomenal leader. I'm happy that he's here after the trade deadline because he's just an all-around awesome person. And those are the kind of people you want on your team. But ultimately, this is a business. And the Denver Broncos have to get below the red in salary cap, which they can do other ways. But... With Simmons having a huge price tag, that could be too appetizing to pass on. Now, unfortunately, for whatever reason, 
I don't understand this, but pro football focus, part of my French, fucking hates Justin Simmons. They never give him the credit he deserves. If you are ranking all 32 times two safeties, uh, 64 starting safeties in the NFL, Justin Simmons is not 69. Nice, but no. Like, for whatever reason, PFF never wants to give Simmons the credit he truly deserves. An overall grade of 57.8. But if this is the way that GMs are looking at him right now, and specifically one in Denver, I could see them going, he's not playing at the top of his game anymore. He's getting older. It's the last year of his contract. We don't think he's going to be coming back anyway after that. And as Bill Belichick says, it's better to move on from a guy one year too early than one year too late. So this could definitely be something to monitor going into the offseason, but we are still months away from that. I do want to share the other two players that the ESPN article included as potential trade candidates. Surprise, surprise, Cortland Sutton and Garrett Bowles. So just something to keep an eye on. But again, we have been on this for months now in the Mile High City. Now, what I want to know from everyone before we sign off and get on out of here is are you buying in on the second half Broncos? The second half of the season, sitting at three and five, riding a two-game winning streak, preparing for primetime matchups against the Bills and the Vikings. Can they get back to 500? Or are we going to be talking about a four and six, three and seven team in two weeks? Let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comment section. That's going to do it for us on today's show. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you have not subscribed to the channel yet, please go ahead and do so. Like the video, all that cliche YouTube stuff. It really helps out the channel grow. Thank you.